Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams D Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And this week, we're here to talk about two new albums. We're here to talk first about the latest album from Vampire Weekend, the first in a good long while. We're going to be talking about God is a God was above us. Only God was above us. Only God right. forgives. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I wish dearly Cliff Martinez was on this album. And we're also going to be joined by a special guest to continue the saga of Beyonce's renaissance. We're going to be talking about Phase 2, Cowboy Carter. Absolutely. Should say as well, uh, we haven't been uploading very recently. We've kind of, we took kind of took a little bit of a hiatus. We kind of burnt out a little bit, if I'm honest, as well as life circumstances, making it kind of difficult to maintain a schedule of uploading as well. But um, so we're kind of going to take an approach, I think from now on of when we have something to say, which should be fairly frequently, but it's no guarantee. But when we do have something to say about new music, we will review it. And other than that, we'll essentially just, work on whatever we want to basically uh, i've got a lot of ideas for music content of course that we want to pursue um that are kind of lined up as well but really it's going to be we're going to play it by ear as we go um but certainly with these two records we had to kind of step up to the mic and talk about them one of them being one of the biggest records of the year which we will get to but the other one being a the comeback of vampire weekend you know which, which is really interesting because the last vampire weekend album 2019s i want to say it was 2019s father of the bride was kind of interesting because it was more of an ezra koenig solo album like he deliberately recorded that record without the other band members of, of vampire weekend and a lot of that what that record is which was kind of like a double album much more sort of stripped back was sort of an attempt to kind of get away from the pressure of following up 2013's Modern Vampires of the City, which was their most critically acclaimed, massively successful album, an album that I loved dearly at the time. I have more kind of conflicted thoughts on it now. I talked about it in a video we did last year. Uh, it's an album where I think about half of the songs on this record are, to me, basically the peak of indie pop. And the rest of the record uh, doesn't quite get there, but it does have a really fascinating identity. It speaks to a lot of the band's concerns with growing up and coming to terms with the sort of gap between the generation that raised you and the generation that you exist within, the kind of expectations and the pressures that are put onto your shoulders as a new generation to do better than previous generations did. That album also... And it had quite heavy religious themes as well, coming to terms with what do you have faith in as an adult? How do you kind of become fully independent in a world that sort of demands that you get everything right and, and basically succeed in the right ways all of the time? I love that album for the way that it approaches those ideas, as well as the way that it just absolutely crushes with some of the most immense and addictive and catchy and just bulldozing songs of that time the new album only god was above us which the title of which actually comes from a quote i think from a woman who who survived an aircraft incident where the roof of the plane was ripped off in in the that middle is of the flight so unfathomably extra I talk about their previous records because this new album, Only God Was Above Us, to me is much closer to the sound of Modern Vampires than it is to the sound of Father of the Bride. The whole band are back in full force on this record. Um, and one of the things that's most interesting about it to me as a long time Vampire Weekend listener, I, w I, I will say a fan, although I didn't really care much for Father of the Bride apart from a couple of really great songs. So I kind of felt like I was falling off the wagon over the years with them. But this new album, I won't bury the lead. I think it's excellent. I think it may well be their best album to date. It's certainly very close between that and 2010's Contra, which I always felt was a really underappreciated follow-up to their debut. But this, to me, I think is the most consistently compelled and fascinated and really taken with an artistic statement from these guys as I have ever been. And 
yeah, it, it bears some sonic similarities to modern vampires. See, the thing is, one of the things that made that album such a step forward from the two before it was that when Vampire Weekend started out in their kind of college blog pop heyday in the late 2000s, their sound was a total response to the sound of alt rock, you know, New York post punk, you know, popular rock you know, on alternative stations in the early 2000s, you know, the bands like The Strokes and Interpol and all that sort of thing, who had this kind of sound that was based a lot in kind of hard-edged, buzzy guitars, distortion, and a kind of really laconic, charismatic persona, whereas, like, detached persona, whereas Vampire Weekend kind of started out as a reaction to all of that. They had no distortion or very little distortion on their guitars or any of their instruments in those early era. It was very Paul Simon influenced sound, very poppy, very bright, very major key. Guitars were very kind of colorful. You think of a song like A-Punk, that's very demonstrative of what Vampire Weekend were in the early days. It was this, you know, light response to a lot of the, the heft and gravity of alt rock music and what made modern vampires interesting was it was kind of a pivot from those first two albums into a sound that was less skeletal than those first two albums that had more muscle that had more kind of weight more bells and whistles courtesy of band member and producer rostam batman Gleesh, who was a huge part of of their sound uh, someone who i would put up there as one of the most influential kind of producers of the 2010s he's been behind the boards on a lot of pop music and so yeah modern vampires had this kind of like more fleshed out sound they had this kind of heftier weight especially to the drums on that record really heavy sound um there was just more bells and whistles as well the guitars the the basic band guitar bass drums you know sound was filled out with a lot more kind of horns and you know really extra orchestral flourishes and that whole record felt very ceremonious and then father of the bride kind of stripped things back to a very kind of guitar focused you know warm sound again but not like peppy poppy like those first two albums just much more kind of like homely and now with only god was above us it feels in some ways like the ultimate uh 180 from their really early days because there's a lot of distortion on this album they got dave fridman to mix it for god's sake it's it's harsh on the ears at times it carries that same sense of of kind of weighty orchestral fulsomeness that modern vampires has but there are also parts of the record where it sounds kind of ghostly and atmospheric and haunting it's got a lot of shades to it uh musically and lyrically and thematically as well it feels like a reflection on a lot of those ideas that i forecasted before that ezra's talked talked about specifically the generation gap you know ezra is someone who came up as being musically someone who's very known for being the voice of of a particular brand of collegey you know intellectual in their mid-20s and now he's in his 40s and he's kind of reflecting on the the the, the privileges and the gifts and the environment that he was given from the generation before him the demands that were placed on him and the demands that are placed on the generation below him now as well the sense with which each generation has to atone for the sins of the previous generations while somehow managing not to create new ones our relentless self-obsession as well is a huge theme of this album too. The the extent to which we obsess and dramatize and, you know, fixate on small aspects of our lives and our problems and kind of blow them up to be massive crises. It's not, it's, I'm not trying to suggest it's one of those albums that is like, you know, all these young people now are too addicted to therapy and all that kind of stuff but it's 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 not that <laughs> but it's like it's like a there's, there's like a, a sense of this album is is trying to kind of shake you out of your self-obsession and it does it in a way that i think carries a lot of wisdom and thoughtful insight as well as self-reflection as well as self-deprecation to a degree too 
Um, there's some aspects of this record that I feel like comment on what it's like to be an artist seeking prestige, mm -hmm. seeking fame, seeking success, um, and, and the kind of journey that that takes you on. Um, there's a lot to this album, and that's kind of just me forecasting it. Um, Jake, I want to throw to you. You came on the Vampire Weekend train very recently, you know, kind of just sort of, I, I want to say that you kind of maybe might have assumed this was a band you wouldn't care for very much, but I'll let you kind of speak to what your thought process was, you know, going into experiencing this band for the first time properly. And then of course, listening to this album and what your thoughts are. Yeah. For those familiar with the kind of podcast dynamic is that a, a, a rift that often appears uh, between uh, the three of us is that Riley was tuned into a certain brand of like indie music and in a scene that Morgan and I weren't just because you're a a little tiny bit well you're the same age as me technically speaking but you're a little older than me and you you were tuned into you know things like Pitchfork in a very pivotal era that tuned you into a specific kind of music uh, and a kind of scene that I have no familiarity with. And recurringly, as we have talked about bands and sounds that have emerged from this era, I have regularly found myself more uh, uh, siding with Morgan of just being like, I don't get this. Or it just kind of feels like a little bit like sonically anachronistic to the point where I just don't have a grounding and everything about vampire weekend like the image the place that they hold in uh indie culture the 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 people that like it not to say that like you know uh, this is a band that basically everybody i know has some amount of affinity for but the image they project just led me to believe this would be a band that i was like not going to get along with and uh everybody told me that i had had to have heard songs from this band because they were so big at one point that it was just kind of inescapable and beyond the opening chords to a punk that's not really true i wasn't really familiar with things like uh ezra keenig's voice for instance so this week i elected to make myself familiar with it to judge this new album uh so i went and listened to modern vampires of the city which is an album that i've been led to believe is more or less pretty important and fundamental to not only their evolution as a band, but their uh, their fan base is sort of like, that's kind of the fan favorite record. Um, and I do really like that album, shock, much to my own shock. Um, I even kind of, I don't know if I would technically agree with the fact that I feel like it's a bit of a structurally lopsided album, uh, even though I, I do think that the weaker parts are probably on the second half, but that was an album that I enjoyed a lot more than I expected to. Uh, I really liked their sound. Uh, it was very sunny. It was very bright. Uh, it was very loose instrumentally, but the song structures themselves were really tight. So I was, uh, I was able to get on board with the fact that they at least knew they had a really like solid grasp on their identity as a band. And I was like, okay, this is something I can get on board with. And since the new album is getting rapturously received, maybe I will get on board. And honestly, as somebody who's on the outside looking in with Vampire Weekend, I found it remarkably easy to love this new album. Uh, I, I mean, everything that Riley kind of set up about the album is absolutely true. I think that it echoes a lot of the sounds from modern vampires of the city, even though uh, I think you could reasonably argue that this is a bit of an instrumental evolution. There's just a lot of moments on here that sound bigger and maybe a bit more dense. Uh, again, not only do we have Dave Fridman behind the boards here, we have the entire Fridman clan, both his son and brother are also uh, on here as well, as well as production credits from a, a, a fucking murderer's row of people from everyone in the world of music to fucking like Nelly Hooper. Like we've got a lot of big names here. And accordingly, it's a sound that isn't like as, you know, it's not as leap out of the your iPhone screen and grab you by the collar as like a, uh, you might expect like a, a, a modern rock or a, in, even like a particularly sharp indie pop album to be. But there's a density to the arrangements here that I find really, really satisfying as an elaboration on where they were before, because it sounds like these guys have more heft now. 
and they blend a really solid amount of organic instrumentation with like really, really heavily treated studio stuff. And that combination of like lo-fi and hi-fi sensibilities makes for a really interesting aesthetic clash where these, you know, fundamentally sunnier pop songs that occasionally can get very structurally ambitious on stuff like uh, my favorite song on here, which is Connect, which is this like hugely audacious, like structurally winding song that I'm just like absolutely enamored with the sound of. Uh, but everything on here just feels so satisfying and, and weighty in a way that even their previous record didn't for me, but still carries over all of their successes and leads me to think that it is the stronger of the two albums. I'm not as well acquainted with Vampire Weekend's music as somebody like Riley, so obviously take my opinion with a grain of salt. Uh, but honestly, this is this is a really consistent album, too. Like, I'm just really happy I can get on board with something that's this tightly constructed as well. It's 47 minutes it's 10 tracks every song here feels really fully fleshed out and kind of reminds me of as again somebody who is less familiar with vampire weekend the two bands that i thought of the most while listening to this were post funeral free reflector arcade fire and animal collective like a more straight laced incarnation of animal collective but particularly the emphasis of things like the piano on an album like this the the glistening effect that it can often have on songs like this really reminds me of the implementation of that instrument that was on albums like feels but also the kind of airier sort of uh more ethereal vibe that something like a neon bible might even have but it marries all of the most accessible parts of these two bands into something that feels like you can't really get what you're getting here from either and i also picked up on a lot of the themes that riley spoke on as well as a hefty dose of like when talking about the generational divide it's uh i probably need to listen to it a little bit more just because koenig's lyrics are a bit uh I guess I would call them charmingly ostentatious at times. Like, again, this is a album with songs called uh, Prep School Gangsters and Gen X Cops. If you're somebody who's struggled to get on board in the past or is just not tapped into the Vampire Weekend, I actually really highly recommend this just because it's very unique. It speaks to a lot of modern generational issues in a way that's very specific and I could easily see putting off people like for example, my co-host Morgan, who might not particularly get along with some of these aesthetic tendencies, um, because they might find them overbearing and annoying, and I can totally see that. But for me, I was able to look past that and uh, basically get on board with everything that this album had to offer. I think it's a pretty stellar record and definitely a highlight in pop music this year. Here, here's the thing, right? I watched a uh, uh, episode of the trash taste podcast that had a guest star of a uh, super eye patch wolf, a uh, very well-renowned YouTuber makes a lot of videos about anime, things like that. My favorite uh, YouTuber. Yeah. One of my favorites as well. Something he said on that podcast is something to the degree of like, you know, I'm never going to make a review for like Starfield or whatever, even if people ask me to, because I don't care. And Considering the sort of burnout that I've felt with a lot of new releases for this entire calendar year thus far, and to some degree in the roughly two years prior with doing this show, I I'm willing to give anything a shot. Uh, and I gave this album a shot. But if I just, if I feel nothing for it, I won't finish it and I won't have very much to say on the podcast because frankly be powering through the entire like 47 or so minutes of this album just for the express purpose of logging on to this podcast and going not for me is a waste of everyone's time <laughs> yeah. so i won't i won't burden you with the the expectation to justify your ambivalence any further i will say though is it just me or does you look at the cover of this album and think, oh, damn, Oasis are dropping a new B-Sides album? I did. <laughs> yeah. it, it inspired the hope a little bit of like, ooh. Nico. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's it, like it, it is very 90s Brit pop. Yeah. Um, just to leap off of what you were saying, Jake. Um, I mentioned that this album 
calls back to or, or like has the most similarities with modern vampires of any of the other albums and that goes beyond just you know bringing back the the choral you know vocal aspect that that album had yeah and the kind of you know more aggressive drum sound and you know and and occasionally busier production that kind of like stifle your headphones in a fun way it's there's that but there's also the fact that this album is kind of like meta reflective in a couple of ways that you'll probably most likely to pick up on if you're a fan of vampire weekend which is that there's like d- d- little motifs of previous songs that they use on this album the biggest example of kind of like reincorporating uh, music from a previous record is that the song gen x cops has the same chord progression and melody as the song hudson off of Mad- modern vampires of the city Yes, which is the kind of morose, doomy, downbeat closing track of that record. Whereas here, that chord progression and melody is is much more kind of lively and built up in this instance. Uh, you have, I can't remember which song it's on, but there's, I think, one song where uh, Chris Bio, the drummer of this band, does the, has one of the most iconic Vampire Weekend drum fills, which is the drum fill from mansard roof the first song on their first album like he just kind of incorporates it into one of the songs on this record and it's such a memorable drum fill that if you know the song you'll instantly recognize it here as well um so there's little tiny elements like that where it's like they're kind of reflecting back or kind of acknowledging directly previous music that they've made and that really gives this kind of the feel of of kind of tying a bow on if not an era of the band and maybe the, the band itself you know Ezra and, and Vampire Weekend they're kind of the the type of band that sort of they make an album when it's time when it feels like it's time to make an album they don't make albums very frequently you know it's been one we had one five years ago and then the one before that was six years before that so there's no telling if we'll get another vampire weekend album and this record in particular feels like it's it's written and designed with this weight of finality to it like we probably probably will get another vampire weekend album eventually but this one specifically to me it felt like it had a bittersweetness and a sense of closure to it a sense of of like not just even musically in those callbacks as well, but in thematically in some of the lyrical subject matter where it's like, these are things Ezra has talked about in the past. And now he's kind of bringing a slightly older wizened perspective of it as a father now, but it does feel a little bit like, okay, I'm, I'm talking about these things, these ideas in a way that sort of is like tying a bow around them basically. And, and finishing a sentence, right. Putting a full stop on a sentence that I started over a decade ago um and nowhere is this truer than in the closing track of this album hope which is one of the absolute standouts of the record to me Killer uh, song. By, by far the longest song that they've ever made and one that kind of has this very weighty grandiose descending melody that really has that feeling of finality to it and lyrically as well it's a song about you know uh, basically telling someone or telling everyone essentially that all the stuff that you fixate on all of the things that you let drag you into the the bowels of of you know unpleasantness of depression of of, of anxiety are things that are transient right are things that are that you can overcome that can be overcome that shouldn't be treated as uh as as a kind of eternal struggle you know, here's the line of the song, the enemy's invincible. And the way he deploys that is not in, in a fatalistic sense. It's in a way where it's like, so go and live your life. You know, so go and do the things you want to want to do. So go and like be apart from that. Um, because in the end, you know, we're, we're all dust anyway. You know, he could be talking about anything. It could be, it could be the inexorable slog of life, the inevitable death, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and it's a really kind of powerful sentiment to emphasize like that. And, and it really does make the record feel momentous. It makes the record feel not grim, but healthy and like, you know, like a like a helpful reminder of what's important. A couple of other favorite songs on the record I want to shout out. One of them is Capricorn which I think is a, has a beautiful concept, which is the concept of this person who was born in the last couple of days of their birth year, 
and feels as though like they can't get any kind of meaning or significance or association with their birth year that, that everyone else seems to have with theirs. So it always feels like they're playing catch up, you know, with each year of their life, they always feel one step behind. And it's, um, it's expressed more elegantly than I'm rehashing it here, but it's a beautiful song. And it also has a guitar sound that I can only describe as sounding like an elephant screaming. <laughs> and it's yeah. absolutely awesome. I really like Connect as well. That song took a bit to grow on me. I like how it is a song. Now I'm gonna it's gonna sound really trite when I say this. I like how it is a song about the difficulties of emotional connection that consists of a bunch of elements that don't really connect all that cleanly with each other. Uh, it's a very obvious musical metaphor, but it's done really beautifully. I love the the way the song kind of jumps around from a, these kind of quieter spaces to these really kind of you know huge embellishments on the core mel melody um and i like that it doesn't hang together because it, it it reflects what the song is about and my favorite song of all on the record is mary boone which is maybe the most modern vampires coded because it really leans into those sort of choral vocals but it also has this drum pattern that like sounds super like mad chester like primal scream psychedelic like it's that weighty heavy drum sound that sounds like you know 10 different types of drum playing at the same time you know very sort of primal scream and you know lyrically this is a song about you know being a young artist and basically trying to to sell yourself and convince people that you are significant by having to appeal to the people with power the tastemakers who decide what art gets elevated specifically the song does this by alluding to mary boone who was a very famous new york art critic in the 80s who's someone who like had the power to decide whether an artist's work would be you know transmitted to enough people for them to kind of have success and achieve a certain level of fame and you know so the song in that way it kind of talks about how success and fame and adoration are so much the product of chance and luck and connections and privilege and being able to you know uh, stroke the egos of the right people at the right time um, and, and the song like approaches this by like being a direct sort of letter to this, you know, fickle art critic who made and killed so many careers, basically begging her to like, learn to love someone, you know, learn to kind of, uh, appreciate art for, you know, appreciate the qualities of art as opposed to kind of the fickleness of, of the business of art. So like, there's a whole Not the critic like, scene from Birdman. Yeah, well, it kind of, <laughs> kind of actually is basically the bit. same sort of point that it's making. Um, but the song does it so beautifully. It has one of my favorite vocal melodies of the record, one of my favorite arrangements, and I just find the whole message of it and the the way that it's conveyed through this sort of letter to Mary Boone to be really, really great songwriting. So yeah, uh, I'm really on board with this Vampire Weekend album. It's one of my top three records of the year so far. Uh, a year which has had a lot of really good music that I've really, really enjoyed. Uh, a lot of music I've kind of appreciated more than outright loved. Very little music that I've been able to kind of fully like think this is, I will remember the year for this. Uh, but this is one of them so far. On that note, let's move in now to our main feature of today's episode. One of the biggest albums of the year so far from, of course, one of the biggest artists in popular music and popular culture, Beyonce back with act two cowboy Carter joining us to review this pr massive project as he did for the previous installment in the trilogy. We have Mr. Cole Duffy. Welcome back to the show. Yeehaw. Yeehaw, indeed. Yes. I, if I owned a cowboy Harder. hat, I would be wearing one, but I don't. Um, <laughs> if I had any foresight, I might have gone to like a, a cheap thrift store and bought one, but um, alas. Uh, yeah, big, big album. A lot of hype surrounding this as well. Now, I don't have, I of course, have never had my ear to the hive ground with the intensity that mm. you do, but Cole, could you give us a little bit of context around Cowboy Carter specifically, how long it's kind of been in the waters that Beyonce might kind of travel down a route of incorporating more sort of Americana into her music, what the kind of basis for that is as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So 
a lot of this you can pinpoint to one incident that happened. Uh, very specifically back in 2016 during the Lemonade era, she, of course, had Daddy Lessons on that album, um, which is a song about learning from your father and, you know, shooting your unfaithful husband uh, <laughs> and all that good stuff. But that song had a very blues, uh, bluegrass, kind of more Southern sound to it. And because of that, she actually performed the track at the Country Music Awards that year uh, and even brought the Dixie Chicks onto the stage to perform with her as a remix uh, with one of their songs, which was a very ballsy move at the time, considering uh, both the atmosphere of America at the time and also just the legacy of the Dixie Chicks, um, you know, having been blacklisted by country radio because the, the fact that they dared to speak up against George Bush and his invasion of Iraq. And an odd thing happened where it was, at the time, the single most popular performance, just in terms of views, to ever happen at the CMAs. And wow. then the very next that. day, they took it down from their website. They took it down from YouTube. They tried to wipe it off the face of the earth. And if you look back at the footage of it, um. There's a whole lot of angry looking faces in that crowd. Um, uh, one person who was there on Twitter actually said they recall uh, a white country singer they did not name saying, get that N word off the stage. Um, so, yeah, a woman born and raised in Houston, Texas was apparently not country enough for the Nashville country music industry. And a lot of Cowboy Carter comes out of this one incident, um, which she talks about, you know, in the opening song, which we'll get to. But her being the archivist that she is, this entire thing is not just her, you know, oh, let me just make a country album. It's more of an, ex an exploration of Americana music itself, diving into different genres and different styles, um, mm -hmm. bringing on different artists, uh, getting shout outs of approval from legends like Dolly Parton and Willie Nelson and then even Linda Martell featured on this. Very uh, she was the appearance from Linda Martell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the first black woman to sell at the Grand Ole Opry and then uh, immediately the country music scene ran her out of town and out of the business. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that we got rumors back when Renaissance was announced in 2022 that there were supposed to be country songs on there which confused everyone because we had heard break my soul and yeah variety was talking about country songs being featured we were like how's that gonna fit um and then once it was revealed that it was going to be a trilogy we we're like oh, okay so it's going to be act two and then the interesting thing is that when this album was announced when this album was released and she put out the announcement and put out like a pr statement basically as you know, she doesn't really do interviews that much. She said that this album was supposed to come first. This was supposed to be act one, but then the pandemic hit and she was like, well, everyone's going to want to dance and have a good time. So Renaissance, which was supposed to be act two, went first ahead of this, which is really interesting to think about considering what a massive, unwieldy album this is. Mm -hmm. Especially if this was going to have dropped uh, probably as planned in like 2020 or 2021 in a, you know, a no pandemic world. Um, it makes more sense what she did to start with Renaissance and then dive into this and really take yeah. our fans and the world on the journey that this album it, is. I didn't know. That was something I must have missed. I did I did some research for this, but I must have missed that. That's really interesting. Um it makes sense because, like, you would imagine this better as a first installment purely in the sense that, you know, so much of what this album is aesthetically is rooted in a lot of things that that she experienced growing up in her youth in, in mm -hmm. Houston. You know, she's talked about... Um, She's talked about going to the Houston rodeo and the experience of kind of being, you know, immersed in that space with all of those kinds of cultural signifiers bleeding through in some way or another into the world that this album cultivates so yeah it is, it's, it's interesting to know that this was maybe intended to come first because i think that makes makes a lot of sense um and what we're like what, uh, what's interesting as well is to me um 
if the if this album and the last one weren't linked by this trilogy construction, I would not really assume much of an association between them because Renaissance to me by and large felt like one of the more musically unified and singular things that she's done it's a very kind mm -hmm. of full-throated tribute to sort of house music and, and, and dance music and that particular kind of tradition of club music whereas this is less about paying tribute to a specific type of music and more about Beyonce reflecting on the a vast swathe of aesthetics that all fit under the umbrella of Americana. Now I, I always I always had this conversation with Jake earlier. I always felt like I, always, I feel like Americana is a better kind of term for what Beyonce's kind of putting her stamp on here than country. Because mm -hmm. to me country yeah. is like an umbrella term for a much more limited set of signifiers. And there's very mm -hmm. little music on this album that I would say is really all that informed by those country signifiers. Um, yeah, and also absolutely. another way that it, it varies from uh, Renaissance is that, like I said, that album is so unified and in, in the music and the types of, you know, uh, sounds it goes for. Whereas this is like so much of the identity of this is like bleeding three or four different genres into one another and most of the major songs in this record kind of do that in a way that is like obviously very pointedly an attempt to make you think about and realize how shallow and pointless the genre conversation is how much of a distraction mm -hmm. it actually tends to be from the art itself when you're so busy focusing on how country is this how you know uh club ready is this how hip-hop is this uh to me one of the big takeaways of cowboy carter is like a a, a just a really sharp assertion to to stop thinking about music like that and stop analyzing albums in that way don't think of this as beyonce's country era or whatever actually mm -hmm. like engage with the the complexity and the multifacetedness that's not a word but go with that of what she's doing uh and so that i think makes for an album that uh, demands a lot more of you than uh, maybe most of Beyonce's other records, but I think also has a lot more to say, is a lot more interesting. It, and also kind of as a product of that, will have maybe a little bit more hit or miss qualities with each individual listener, depending on uh, what aspects of the record they're able to get on board with or not. Like this is an album that mm -hmm. some stuff I really love, some stuff I don't quite think comes together, but I love that mm -hmm. about it. I, I really appreciate that. I appreciate that it's it's committed to pulling itself in so many different directions and tying so many different aesthetic threads together that it becomes unclassifiable and it becomes such a mixed bag i don't mean a mixed bag of quality even if you feel that way but just a mixed bag of like everything <laughs> of like just <laughs> ways of executing the vision i guess i don't know what mm -hmm. what are your kind of thoughts cole on 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 the, i guess what was your impression of the album kind of as it dropped and what are your kind of overall thoughts on what beyonce is trying to do with cowboy carter so when she announced the singles uh, Texas Hold'em in 16 Carriages via the Verizon commercial at the Super Bowl. Uh, I was at a Super Bowl party. Immediately was like, can someone hand me my purse, please? And, you know, just grab my AirPods and listened. And That's I like right. both songs. Right. I, <laughs> I prefer 16 Carriages a lot more. I, I think that's the I fan do. favorite out of the two singles. Uh, I do like Texas Hold'em a lot. I just have one specific complaint about it that we'll get to later. Uh, yeah. But I was excited, but a little nervous. I was like, I don't really like country music. Is she going to get me to really enjoy it? And, you know, I mean, when I say I don't like country music, I don't really like the Nashville sound. You know, that sort of like poppy, you know, like body like a back road or whatever else I can pull out of the back of my mind at the moment. But, you know, like the radio stuff. Um, I was going to say the last 10 years of charting country music. <laughs> basically yeah exactly 
And I was wondering, okay, how's this all going to tie together? Because she's got like this radio kind of thing going on in the promos. It's got this Paris, Texas vibe going on to it as well. And so I was trying to figure out how it was all going to come together. And then the track list dropped and we were all like, 27 tracks, that can't be right. And like, which ones are interludes? Uh-huh. And then someone said, oh yeah, the album's like almost 80 minutes long. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, all right. So she's in her Janet Jackson era at this point. That felt <laughs> right, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. I was like, oh shit, yep. all right. Yep, so yep, let's yep, see yep. how it goes. And then... When the album finally dropped and, you know, I didn't really pay that much attention to what everyone was saying on my timeline. I was like, okay, I just got to lock in and listen to this whole thing. And then it just, you know, it blew me away, frankly. Jake, what were your initial impressions of this? As time has passed, I've slowly found myself becoming more and more and more of a Beyonce fan. It's really the really kind of hard pivot of Beyonce's self-titled forward, where she just kind of really planted her foot into being like, I am a contemporary albums artist. And the moment that happened, the moment I really started to get her. Uh, even at her most messy with something like the the self-titled, I was just like, there's something really special about this. And that this is one of our biggest pop stars in the world being genuinely risky and subversive and fascinating in a way that no one on her level is really being right now. And that just kind of continued with the steady stream of that And then you have Lemonade following it up with just, you know, hugely conceptual, amazingly like divergent and sound of what that album is going for. Uh, Really great record. Love it a lot. And then we have Renaissance come out and we were all really into that album. If you all uh, recall, if you go back and watch our episode on it. And I still am like, again, I, I very much agree with Riley and that that was refreshing for two reasons. One being that it's, another great Beyonce album delivering on the same level of quality that she's been delivering on and, you know, really focusing on having an album statement, but it's also the most unified that she's been in a really long time. It's like her isolating one specific thing and then executing that and then doing it about as well as she possibly could have. And the interesting Mm -hmm. thing now about looking back on act one of Renaissance is that that is a 60 minute long album that feels considerably tighter than this does uh because this is 20 minutes longer has a much longer track list and i'll admit this is like from a macro sense there's a lot of barriers for entry with this record and i completely understand why this has been a more difficult sell than renaissance and a more difficult sell than anything she's made in a while. Like this is still getting overwhelmingly like positive critical responses. But from what I can tell on a, like from a larger output, it seems that people are a little bit more mixed on this than Renaissance and frankly, or at least act one, I mean, and it's totally evident as to why this is a mess. Like it's, it's 80 minutes long, it's 27 tracks. You have to make a deliberate concerted effort to make something that doesn't sound like a mess just with that framework. So as somebody who loves mess the way that I do, I was really excited for this because I didn't like when, like when you hear Beyonce's releasing a 27 track long album, maybe it's just the fact that I am uh, trying to acclimate myself to the news cycle with a uh, newly acquainted Swifty girlfriend, but I didn't believe that shit for a second when that came out. I was just like, no, it's not. The new Beyonce <laughs> album is not 27 tracks long. I do not believe this for a moment. I will believe it the moment I see it. And then I did the, and saw the it. Work, I was like, okay. The working cut of uh, yeah, Francis that Ford is... Coppola's <clears throat> Megalopolis is Megalopolis. four hours and 50 <laughs> minutes. Yeah, and exactly. And I got that as Zodiac like, Killer no. Letter uh, track list. no the fuck no the fuck this is not like i don't believe this shit and then i was just like i really need to start getting used to the fact that every time something outlandish with a pop star happens it's actually probably just true now 
and I should stop fighting my I, I like I for some reason I have a natural instinct to rebel against what I'm being told, even though nine times out of 10 now, it's always true. And I'm just like, maybe I just need to maybe I just need to open myself up to possibility. And that's kind of what I went into Cowboy Carter with is that I just wanted to be like, I, I'm so much less interested in the country music and genre conversation than everybody is. I just want to see what this album does. Because if you're familiar with Beyonce, you have an album like Lemonade, which is, yeah, again, that's the, the, the divorce concept album. But what's fascinating about an album like that is that it's not just about that. It's also about the greater context of Black women in America and their treatment over the last 300 years. Uh, and, like, it's not, you know, she Beyonce's not there reading statistics at you or anything. But all of this is informed and you can feel it on that album. And, so like, with an album that is so centered around American iconography and just these ideas in general... What is she going to do with it? Like, I mean, it's just like there's a it's a sandbox of possibilities. And what happens on here is we get the fabled double album masterpiece from Beyonce, where you have these interludes, these shorter tracks, bigger tracks that are the obvious, you know, pop center pieces of the album, uh, are a record that feels really kind of unwieldy, maybe isn't as tightly structured in the back half. But in borrowing from the sounds that it does and that like we can you can debate about how authentic something like this is to begin with. But like what this does is does call back to the kind of pop country of bands like the Dixie Chicks, for instance, bands that I grew up very, very exposed to. So Beyonce is dealing with a very specific sect of music right now that is very nostalgic to me that I hold very close and very dear to my heart that I'm still very fond of. And in doing so, I kind of think that for all of this album's inevitable messiness, which it undeniably does have, and I'm sure people like Morgan and Riley are probably more well-equipped to talk about these messy things and maybe things that just outright don't work for people because obviously there's just a more there's just more ingredients here so there's a bigger likelihood that they might not all work with you that said i love this album in fact i would confidently assert that this is my favorite thing that beyonce has ever made purely because of the fact that it is her riskiest and boldest statement when it comes to just music and when it comes to the macro of what she is saying about America in general uh, and she doesn't get too ambitious I feel like she doesn't overshoot her boundaries I feel like she plays things close enough to the chest so that it never quite loses itself even though it is very sprawling some notable standout moments that I have to highlight here are I want to talk about the opener American Requiem which is just this hugely bombastic like when I heard this I knew I was in for something awesome just because this is the kind of grandiosity and scale and sound. Like there's just an overwhelming raw power mm. in a song like this where I'm like, God, I fucking miss when pop stars were this immediate and big sounding and they are just like, I'm here, motherfucker, listen to me. Because every fucking big release from a pop star so far this year has been so snoozy, has been so forgettable. It's been so in one ear and out the other. It's just nice to hear somebody come out and be like, this is me, I'm big, don't fucking ignore me. And it's awesome and it's far from the only moment just like that uh segueing right into blackbird oh. after that is definitely a choice i do just want to lay out the groundwork of both of these cover choices to me the purpose of them was immediately apparent blackbird is a song that paul mccartney wrote about a little girl he saw during the the civil rights movement and i think using that as kind of a segue to talk about some of beyonce's more backward looking moments on this part of the album is a really really smart move and it also fits into the theme of her you know taking rock music more generally and kind of using her image and superimposing it on top of that and also way more prominently with what she does with Jolene, reworking the lyrics to kind of flip the power dynamic of the song. 
I love the duet with Miley and Beyonce on here. Um, the the song uh, Most Wanted, in fact, uh, is one of my favorite tracks on here. It's the most I've liked Miley on anything before. And it feels like this is the only album I've listened to in the past decade that's known how to mix Miley's voice so that it doesn't sound like this abrasive, scratchy, ugly thing that I hate listening to on albums like Endless Summer Vacation. Thank God the vocal mixing is so good on this album all across of it. And all right, look, I don't like Post Malone. I've never liked Post Malone. I don't like his hit singles. I don't like him in general. I am wary of his inclusion on anything. I like him on this song on here. Everybody hates him on uh, this album and on the song that he is uh, included on, which is Levi's Jeans. I don't think this is one of the best moments on the album. However, it is the most I have liked the sound of this man's voice ever, period. Like it's, it's frivolous, it's silly. I still think the song is better for it because of the vocal chemistry. Big old shrug, I know. Maybe it's just my willingness to try to embrace the mess of the record, but frankly, I really love it. Um, and honestly, I my other hot take is that I think this album is incredibly well paced uh, for as big bombastic and for as many interlude tracks as there are. I think the sequencing gets a little choppy at the very end of the album. My only overriding issue with it. But otherwise, this is exactly the kind of big, bold pop album that we are sorely missing. I'm kind of over the moon about it. I love it. It's one of my favorite albums of the year so far. Kicking off with American Requiem, basically co-sign everything you said, Jake. This song is so, like, I, going into this, fully expected Beyonce to deliver, and, and, and kind of, you know, I would have been disappointed if she hadn't, to deliver this sense of, of ceremoniousness, of momentousness, that a, a project specifically with the kind of weight of context and history that this evidently was going to have even before you heard it and you know obviously to take on to do a project that takes on so many different aesthetics and so many different pieces of culture that have been so gentrified essentially across mm -hmm. modern history that have been so kind of like warped in and associated with whiteness specifically where so much of like the aesthetics and the music and the culture that this records dovetails with you know belongs as much to black america as it does to white america if not more in some ways so american requiem is kind of a beautiful way i think to sort of forecast mm. that and, and and tell you that the record is going to be kind of in a pretty big part about addressing that about addressing how this is not you know beyonce stepping into a white world this is beyonce kind of reasserting and recontextualizing a lot of of pieces of culture that have become gentrified that have become associated with whiteness and kind of bringing the history of blackness back into that and, and putting it at the forefront and that's what i think is so powerful about american requiem and the way that it comes in is that it, it demands your attention and that it, it demands that you think about the seriousness of that you know and it's not about the seriousness of beyonce now one of the things that i i tolerate about beyonce but don't love necessarily all the time is the degree to which her music can be about how great she is I think she certainly has a lot to brag about and she certainly can be a really powerful and like compelling performer when she's in that, you know, I'm on that queen shit mode, but it's just not the mm -hmm. most powerful thing that she can give for me anyway, as a listener. I, I, I simply do not relate ever. <laughs> so for Beyonce to be kind of putting that kind of weight and power behind her her purpose and the statements she's trying to make with the song as opposed to just you know herself uh, although her life and her identity is obviously a big part of it too uh, i it really hit like i was really i really really love yeah. this what do you think cole mm -hmm. yeah um the first like five seconds immediately like knocked my jaw to the floor mm. um it's just such an incredible sound just it's I would say her best album opener she's ever done. It's just such a stunning way to introduce you to the world of the album, the themes of it, how everything's going to relate. And just what an incredible, like, psychedelic rock sound. I never thought I would hear her sing over. Hmm. I cannot wait to hear how this sounds in a stadium. 
the the principal instrument on the song is a sitar for fuck's sake i mean you're you're people mm -hmm. it, it what i love about that is that you know it, it it forecasts the way that this record is going to veer into some new spaces aesthetically and musically for beyonce but it also does a great job of kind of dispelling this whole like this is going to be a country album like reductive thing because a sitar is not mm -hmm. a fucking country instrument like yeah it's a it's Only a if your country is india <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Like, yeah, sure, it, it's a, you know, it's an organic kind of acoustic instrument that here has been like slathered in pedals, um, but, you know, it, it's distinct and it's not a sound that you usually hear in popular music anymore. Um, and, you know, if your education is in Western music specifically, it's more likely to conjure the Beatles than it is to conjure... The Rolling Stones. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, Rolling right? Stones, mm -hmm. um, and speaking of the Beatles, to then go into the Blackbird cover... Um, Jake, you kind of forecasted the contentiousness of the covers on this album, which I do find interesting. I mean, here's the thing, right, is that this album's already been kind of like hoisted up as this cultural event, this conversation starter, which is good because a record like this should be a conversation starter. There's a lot of conversations that I think are quite important that I'm sure are, and if not should be happening as a result of this album. Um, the goodness of these covers I think is not up there. I think more important is is the purpose and the intent of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not difficult to see if you know anything about Blackbird, why Beyonce would cover it. Um, and especially the original being a song that was written by a white man in sympathy for young black women is given an additional weight when those words are sung by not just a black woman, but black women as well. And I do think that, that the incorporation of the additional vocalists on this cover adds a lot of significance to it too. I like that more than if it were just Beyonce. It really reinforces the sense of solidarity that the song is about. Even if the original song was a, was about a kind of cross-cultural sense of, of solidarity, this kind of being reinforced specifically with one black woman to another black woman, with black women to each other, uh, you know, absolutely in, in enhances the weight of the song. I think it's a very powerful cover, and I'm a big fan, personally. Yeah, I, I absolutely adored it. I loved how simple she kept it. Like, I know that when she reached out to get approval to cover it, she used the original backing track, the original instrumental, and just keep mm -hmm. it really nice and simple. And then mixing in all these Black female country artists, uh, Britney Spencer, Rena Roberts, Tanner Adele and Tierra Kennedy just adds to this really beautiful choir that especially mm -hmm. comes together at the end and just a really gorgeous moment of music. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was, I was a big fan, you know, initially when I heard it, I was like, Oh, she's just using the backing track of, of the original song and then cover it and doing harmonies. But of course, that's the kind of reductive observation that you quickly overcome when you bring any degree of like insight to that, anything. That, that is all. It, it is merely an observation. Um, mm -hmm. There's <clears throat> the sense with which um, covers to justify their existence have to be transformative. And here's the thing, right? Even if this isn't all that musically transformative, the incorporation of the vocalists, the, the context and the perspective of the song is fundamentally transformative in this cover, even though very little is, is changed in like a what you're hearing sense. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think actually having the backing track from the original song, but with these new vocalists is kind of a beautiful way of sort of bridging the song from its original context to where it is now. Um, I, I, the more I've, I've thought about this Blackbird cover, the more I've, I've, I've really, really appreciated it. It's interesting sequencing wise, I think to put what I feel is the absolute showstopper of this album at the very beginning of it, but it is also a song that is sort of crafted to be the intro track to what is being done here. And I think in terms of like a mission statement, I can't, there are like few albums in recent memory that have had more sonically compelling, almost like deliberately wrong footing you, but in a way that is really, again, compelling. Cool for an artist like Beyonce it's just sounds here that you would never have expected and I think it's a top three candidate between X1 and X2 so far and in terms of the Blackbird cover I, I don't have heaps to add there's sort of an argument to be made about covers um 
and their transformative nature, especially within the realm of country and folk music of like a lot of the times they're not transformative at all just because it's Luke Combs over Tracy Chapman's fast car or playing it with her at the Grammys. I don't need to change anything about this really because it's just like extra ornamentation mm. or whatever is like sort of distracting from what the song is getting at. And that's not always the case, but I think particularly in the, well, in the, in the genres of music where mostly what you have is three chords and the lyrics being transformative isn't necessarily the goal, I mm. guess, to, you know, quote unquote, justify its existence or whatever. Well, let's um, say think about it like folk music is an oral tradition, right? Like a lot of old folk songs, like are passed through the generations, especially before the era of like recorded music. You know, folk songs were passed through via oral tradition. You know, a generation would but play the songs that of the generation that came before. And so for, I think, a cover like this to emphasize that oral vocal element uh, as the the point of transmission, um, you know, it's just really fitting for the kind of song that this is. Um, it's it's not just, uh, you know, reassessing the context of of that old Paul McCartney song. It is, this, it is the 2020s speaking to the 1960s um, in terms of, of the environment and the culture for you know, the place in America that, that black people and black women specifically had. Um, so yeah, I think Beyonce kind of stays true to that in a way that she maybe wouldn't if she added a, you know, an electric guitar and like some, you know, yeah. programmed yeah. drums and shit. Made, she um, made it a synth cover. Yeah. So <laughs> I think she kind of understands that. And that's the power of it is, is that you don't change, you lose the potency if you change too much with a song like that, I think. And, and and unfortunately, what comes to mind a lot nowadays for me it, it, when somebody says a transformative cover of this classic song is like the uh, that cover of the Bjork song that was in Terminator Dark Fates trailer, where it's just like, oh, Jesus, this is ass. <laughs> you tra yeah, it's transformative. You transformed it into a pile of doo doo. Abolished the movie Traver's song cover industrial complex immediately. Yeah, I transformed it. Ava bad. Max. I think tra tra transformative is a bad word. I think maybe like a better way of putting it with with me and covers is kind of like, I just need to feel like there's a reason you're covering this that isn't just you like the song. Um yeah. that, that you have yeah. like a thing that you're saying by covering it. Um and and Beyonce like eh, full text across the board for this one for on that basis. Sixteen Carriages, I think, is is my favorite song on the album. Um, I'm not going to say that it's for lack of competition because it certainly isn't. There's a, a, quite a few songs on this record that I out and out love, but 16 Carriages. Um, and it's, again, it's interesting, right? Because hearing it in and out in the album and like just hearing it with headphones as well, as opposed to ear pods, like I really began to appreciate the greatness of it in a way that I didn't. I think when we initially sort of talked about these singles when they dropped, you know, I was like, you know, six, I like 16 Carriages more than Texas Holden. They're both good. Da 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 da. Um, but no, this is a this is a perfect song. Uh, I the way that the guitar comes in, the stomp that it has, Beyonce's command as a performer, but also the way that it's that she tells essentially the story of, of being in transit through her life, growing up, the way that the sixteen carriages that are transporting her acquire a new sort of context, new sort of meaning as the song goes on with each iteration. It's just wonderful. Like, I, I love the song so much. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I mean, I think both of the songs work much better in the context of the album than they do than they did as singles, which is not really saying anything for an album's artist. It's just the way the beast sometimes you you do in fact have to. Although Beyonce doesn't have to market herself, but I guess you know it's it's also part of the traditional rollout that she's also attached to. Um, literally she 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 isn't <laughs> yeah um <laughs> yeah that is things magnificent I, yeah that it, it's is quickly become enormous, a man that fucking yes <laughs> and just again he, little little ways in which she's incorporating aesthetic kind of uh motifs from the genre she's pulling from the twang in the song 
you know it's given so much it's not just like oh there's a country twang in the song it is like a part of these these songs again are so much more than the sound that they're pulling from and a lot of that comes from the real sharpness of the writing on this album which for the most part Mm. is excellent uh i will say i'm more compelled by beyonce as a writer on this record than maybe any of her other previous ones um that's not to denigrate the writing and the lyricism on those previous records but i just think here there's an addition there's Beyonce is a really good storyteller on this record, and you can tell there's a level of personal history that reaches all the way back to her childhood that informs the way she writes here, and I just get a little bit more pathos from that. Um, and it's just got an extra level of kick to it. I'll skip straight to Texas Hold'em. At this point, the other you know single that was concurrently released with this one, mm-hmm. um, this one has grown on me quite a bit, and it was like one of those things where it grows on you without even listening to it. Part of it is because it's really fucking catchy. Uh, it has been playing on the radio a fair amount. I've been hearing it just in the environment. Radio, of my TikToks, workplace. Instagram stories. Yeah, fucking... yeah, it went number one here. It's uh, it's her longest running number one hit in the United Kingdom. For some <laughs> Which reason. is like so random, right? This, I, this I've, I've had nights where at my workplace, it cycles between that and break my soul back to back. Dude, it, bless. The, this was something that came up in the discussion about the sort of wider thesis about genre that the album has. Is like, it's really fascinating that it would be her longest running number one in the United Kingdom. Because in Europe, it's like, especially when it comes to like festival lineups and a lot of stuff like that, the people were like, people flock in that parts of the world to see the music. Those are like bigger events here than, you know, I feel like festivals in America ever really register as as big as some of yeah. those are. There's no real genre delineation for them. There's no like, here's a rock festival, here's a, a pop festival, here's a dance festival. It's like a lot of the the biggest ones, anyways, will all sort of like on here we have Black Midi, and next up we have Miley Cyrus or something like that. <laughs> you know, it's like this Billy Eilish every... and the Mars Volta. Like yeah, everything. It's like as long as it's popular at all it will be on the glastonbury stage and so Mm -hmm. it's like there's also just a wild history of what exactly has been number one on the uk charts it's like sort of insane to consider so it's like (laughs) random as hell that texas hold'em would be a number one hit there and also entirely fitting i I love the song it's just uh, so much fun it's so much fun i've had that um I'll be damned if I can't slow dance with you, come for some shit. That whole part, dance with you. I've had that just it's, rattling it, around my head all week. I I do think that this out uh, like it's not as obvious just because there aren't as many like truly like throw the gauntlet down powerful like vocal like again she's not getting up there like Whitney Houston per se. But I think this album maybe stealthily contains Bay's best vocal performances, just like. It showcases the versatility of her voice, like that falsetto that she delivers at the end of the hook there, I feel like is kind of a a key element as to why so many of the hooks are so sticky on this album is that she's really employing not just how beautiful her voice sounds, which, yes, you know, Beyonce, she's a good singer, of course, but she's sort of demonstrating her voice as a tool on this album a bit more effectively since maybe even the self-titled. Yeah, I would say this and four are her best vocal showcases. Oh, question. Does she have, yeah. like, n- naturally a, a pretty, a, a reasonably strong Southern accent at all? Because... uh, I, When she used to talk a lot, like, back in the early 2000s, yeah, and people figure, made right, because, fun of it. Yeah. People were this pretty happens. vicious yeah. about it. This happens with a lot of celebrities, and I'm sure it was on some pretty strong level also exacerbated by being black and a black woman as well, Mm -hmm. where it's like if you're from the South, and listen to me speaking on this, uh, but if you're from- (laughs) You got two Southerners here, you're fine. If you're from the South and you you know make it big or whatever, and your success is not based around that identity- then you have to lose the accent. You know, you have to kind of, mm-hmm. you have to find a, a more acceptable, you know, uh, yeah, tonality. To gentrify yourself. Yeah. Um, so uh, like a subtextual aspect of this record, and, and maybe it's not fully subtextual, but it certainly is mostly, that I like is that it's kind of a commentary on that. 
you know, that sense mm. with which you have to, you know, you have to change your voice. You have to kind of conform like in a very literal way, because it's about yeah. a, a fundamental a, a aspect of your expression. And so hearing Beyonce lean into these kind of uh, like Southern elements, these twangs, these accents, these little, little vocal features, you know, ostensibly because that's a quality of the music that she's aping, but also on another level, because that's who she is. And it's a real yeah. her. And so, like, when you say, Jake, that you feel like this is one of her, like, if not her most sort of strongest set of vocal performances, like, I feel like a, a, a part of that feeling comes from the way that this true Southern, like, you know, aspect of who she is, is like fully uncovered and put on display here. It gives, That's it's part like of the this, versatility. It's like the songs are, are all, <clears throat> this is maybe a weird way to put this, but it's like the songs are all wider than anything on renaissance mm. it's just a larger mm -hmm. playing field for her to inhabit mm -hmm. instead of something that's so like on the floor Focused. like mm -hmm. renaissance is right yeah. renaissance is like airtight yeah and texas hold him like the, the lyrics of the song you know there's plenty of lyricism on this record that as i said before i think is like but affecting and meaningful and like drawing together parts of her life but there's also songs like this one where it's almost like it's like a laundry list of signifiers or of like motifs or of like little like um things and like that works for the song because it's like just throwing like it, it's like so hoe down type beat like it's like reveling in how much it's just embracing and throwing all of these like things at you um it's so can over I, the top and almost can I be tacky can i be tacky and say that there were multiple points at which i thought about the comparison to the hannah montana movies hip-hop hoedown i was literally <laughs> just about the joke that this is a uh, hoedown throwdown's older more mature sibling <laughs> i know right like <laughs> so i, I do oh, no. really like because of how silly the song is in an endearing mm -hmm. way i do like how it's kind of written like just throw as many fucking you know southern shit yeah. into this thing as possible and make it fun and it and it's fun you can oh, you want to stomp around to it you want to fucking i don't know mm -hmm. line dance or whatever it is you want to just <laughs> that's not line dancing <laughs> But, you know. It's Jason Isabel's <laughs> cast iron skiller for people who aren't contemplating suicide. Yeah, I don't know if um if uh if Isabel has a hoedown song. Maybe truckers do. Um anyway. Uh, truckers were burning yeah. shit up. My, yeah. my one complaint about this song is the whistle that comes in at like after the second chorus, I believe. I'm just like, okay, I can see the car commercial happening right now. Yeah, but that, I don't that's not even her fault. Ever. That's that's just like the last like okay. 10 years of commercials. Like that's yeah. not her problem. And then it's like again, for the song is almost whiplash inducing and in how like you know cartoonishly southern it all is. And then you just bounce mm -hmm. off of this into bodyguard, which is kind of like a it's so different. It's so like it's like a enough. Natalie and Bruglia song or something. <laughs> weirdly oh, enough, yeah. I've been so much. Weird, weirdly enough, the band I thought of while listening to this, it's not like they it sounds hugely like them, but they just popped into my head for whatever reason. It's like Magdalena Bay, like uh, you know, like a kind of modern Ooh. sort of um sort of synthy poppy band that are kind of influenced by loungy sort of down tempo kind of 90s aesthetic there, there's a tightness to something like you lose that i feel a connection with though yeah I, I, or I maybe maybe like it's maybe it's just a little bit more like you know kylie minogue or or something i don't know mm -hmm. it's it's a really fun song i really dig it i was not expecting mm -hmm. it at all mm -hmm. yeah i i could easily see this being like another hit single off of the album yeah, I'm kind of shocked that it was like, I mean, I guess that the other ones are a bit more single ready, but this was just something where I heard it instantly. And I was just like, this is like instant pop song of the year contender. Like the vocal performance is buttery smooth. The hook is great. I love the subject material, the sort of relationship dynamic that's on display within the actual context of the song. Like that's something that I really like too, is that on every true blue centerpiece track on the record, 
it's about some kind of relationship dynamic between Beyonce or whoever she's talking about as the main character and somebody else. And that sort of like synergistic relationship is elaborated upon in each one of these songs in a really distinctly different way. And it really mm-hmm. fleshes out the identity of the album in a really satisfying, really three-dimensional way for me. And the track list, at least, Body God through Alligator Tears really sets up an interesting dynamic in her jealousy. It's Mm -hmm. sort of this opening, you know, peeling back the layer to reveal that she can be jealous to the point of sounding like a complete psycho, which she does on Alligator Tears especially. Yeah, that's Um, kind of awesome. (laughs) That's kind of what I was about to get into, which is that um, there's like a subplot on this album. I was going to characterize it as Beyonce's uh, sense of, of... of needing to protect those around her but i think you could like kind of the territorialness yeah you could kind of Mm. kind of spin that into a little bit more of a control thing because beyonce is someone who's incredibly controlled about you know her life and the way that she's talked about and you know the image that she puts forward and so there's this interesting sub narrative beneath all of the aspects of um you know kind of um the history of 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 americana and black women's place in americana there's this interesting sub narrative of the the this deeply rooted need to kind of have control and and you know agency and ownership over the things in your life not in the sense that you you know restrict or harm the ones that you love because you know there's a song like protector which is a you know beautiful ode about parenthood and and that's uh, very well lovely song. addressed but there is this sense with which beyonce has this uh a core part of her identity is that she is she has this need this desire to kind of of, of control and, and and look after and care for the things that are close to her maybe that could be peeled back further to a sense of of um concern about the fragility of things of, of potentially mm-hmm. losing any of the things that she has um and that's an aspect of, of beyonce's personality that appeals to me much more than the uh than the you know i i'm the goat i'm on that queen shit yada yada, yada stuff and this does bring us nicely into the Jolene cover because um, Jake, you forecasted before some of the discourse surrounding this beautifully. So I'm thankful I don't have to touch that with a 10 foot pole. I, <laughs> I don't, I don't like this cover. I'll say that, but I don't like the reason I don't like it is not because Beyonce betrays the spirit of the original song. Mm-hmm. I completely understand why she changed the lyrics and within the context of this little narrative that we've just sort of tapped into of Beyonce's like the kind of person that Beyonce is and the kind of things that she values and the sense of, of control that she needs to have over any potential incursions on her life and, and the way that she's curated her life. It makes perfect sense. Um, it just, this specific song just leans a little bit too much into the, I'm a bad bitchness of it all. And it's not quite the way I would have liked to have seen her kind of explore that because it comes across a little bit two dimensional for me. And the original song, I think, is quite a, a three dimensional song about not just vulnerability and 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 self doubt and, and and image issues, but also like um you know the the need to be loved and the need to be able to trust. And the song again pointedly not accidentally steps away from that into a you know into beyonce's lemonade-esque uh charade of you know get the fuck away from my family bitch six you know, inch yeah um <laughs> and like i loved that on lemonade because that whole thing with that album was like uh within Beyonce's lashing out against the, the the vulnerabilities of her family unit and because of all the shit that happened, you know, there's this real sense of a kind of of someone who is who's been put into a really vulnerable situation unfairly and is kind of, you know, reckoning with that and dealing with that and trying to kind of reassemble their life. Whereas here it just kind of feels like it's dropped in to the album and it doesn't really have 
much to add about Beyonce or to say. It's just, and and the fact that this is this this like, you know, I'm a bad bitch and get the fuck out of my away from my family thing that the song is doing is in the context of a Jolene cover kind of makes it even more sort of confusing to me. Uh, I, I have to imagine. And I'm especially kind of miffed about this because there's another Dolly Parton collaboration on this album that I fucking love and I'll get to it. Like legitimately one of my favorite songs on this album is the other song that she does with Dolly. And this, I think, just feels Deeply like it, it doesn't quite uh, need to be here. I don't think. Um, oh, that's actually, I need to stop saying this doesn't need to be here because that's kind of like a, a non-answer or a non-criticism. It doesn't, it kind of detract, it kind of distracts from or pulls away from uh, what I've been enjoying about the album up to this point. Um, but I don't hate it. I don't dislike it. I'm not one of those people who thinks that it's a cardinal sin to change the lyrics of a song. I mean, why the fuck would I think that if Dolly Parton herself is on the fucking record right before the song starts, basically cueing her in to do that. Like, mm -hmm. there's no need. I to get simply all would have made fun of you if that was the reason you took issue with the song. There's no need to get all like. I love, I love her introduction. She's like that hussy with the good hair. I'm like, <laughs> that was that's that's a good callback. That hussy. Yeah, my, yeah the everything she says, flaming Auburn locks. I just I, I love that she, I love hearing hearing Dolly Parton's voice is a joy. Um, hearing hearing Dolly Parton and Willie Nelson in any context is never going to do you anything but give you bonus points from me because I could listen to those two talk about literally goddamn anything. Especially when <laughs> Willie is basically just like, "Hey y'all, I'm blitzed." <laughs> Willie Nelson, he, thing. he absolutely had some whiskey in the studio right before he recorded that vocal. The, the Willie Nelson. Oh, I know they were smoking out back. in there. <laughs> the Willie Nelson features on these little like radio interstitials are really cool. I kind of wish the album had more of them in a weird way. I because it it's like I a framing agree. it's like a framing device that the record sort of teases with, but only does it a couple of times. Yeah. So if yeah, if maybe there was something to introduce like that, we talked about how the album has that brief kind of like jealousy arc with the leg. Like maybe if it was a little bit more cleanly divided, I feel like that might add something to the structure, which is again the only real misgiving I kind of have with the record i to mm -hmm. to briefly just like i'm not going to go on a tangent or anything here but i i to kind of balance what you said about the jolene cover it's like first of all it's i just want to thank you very briefly for elaborating on your feelings in a way that actually made sense i feel like it was impossible for that to happen up until this point thank god for this podcast sometimes jesus christ however the it's it's the alchemy of the transformation itself i i feel like that's kind of a a blessing and a curse with this album is that i you kind of need like i really like the jolene cover for the the both the reason of i think she covers it well and i like the changes in this context but the like i feel like in isolation it's difficult to appreciate this cover. You need the context of the original version. You need the context of what Beyonce is doing here. It's very, it leans on the conceptual framework of this album harder than anything else does in order for you to truly mm -hmm. understand why it's being done in the first place. And that's fine by me. Like, as long as you do it confidently, I'm okay with that. But I also understand why that's just kind of a more difficult sell for other people is because, like, they're, you're, you're taking something classic, you're revamping it, that's already going to be a struggle with some people. But changing that framework is going to come with its own set of limitations in a way that, like, the Jolene cover just doesn't, like, it's the only moment on the album where I feel like that's just kind of overridingly true it doesn't bother me but it's the most like nakedly like it just kind of owes it to something else which is why i feel like it's a it's a little bit more of a steady ground or unsteady ground than the blackbird cover for instance it's been really interesting to see the response to this cover in particular because of that lightning bolt quality it's got at least to like whatever discussion or whatever and then for it to be like one of the highest charting songs on the album like one of the most talked about one of the most like everyone's paying attention to it um a lot of people i know who don't really care for her that much but kind of like overall actually really like the cover for some reason which was like oddly surprising to me 
but there is a fun to it just like singing along like waving handguns in the air just like pretending you know that joe leans right in front of you and you're just gonna the, shoot her right in the damn face the, the two dimensionality like i i completely agree with riley that the the, the song is made more two dimensional i just like that mm -hmm. And look, big respect. I think for me, it plays a little bit like, you know, people on Twitter riffing on the song or something, you know, like a meme you'd see, like um, Jolene when, when I get my fucking hands on her or whatever. Like, it's just, it's a little bit like you'd see a, a reaction gif and the song is like that. Yeah. Um, again, I don't, I don't dislike it. And I think it kind of speaks a little bit more to Cole, you kind of forecasted this sort of thread of, of, of sort of Beyonce's inner you know, desire to kind of, um, you know, c control and kind of have, you know, her life be resilient against these sort of incursions. And I haven't quite found like a way to cleanly uh, analog that sub narrative with the other stuff that she's doing uh, on the record. So that's uh, one of the reasons why the album is a little bit kind of unwieldy for me because it feels like there's a few different directions she's pulling in in terms of the things that she's talking about and i like mm -hmm. some of those directions individually but together it feels like it doesn't quite all fit together perfectly um but that's a like that's the kind of natural sort of criticism that someone like me would have who's like very analytical and especially is is kind of trying to understand a record that is 27 songs long to briefly step back to the Willie Nelson thing. I kind of thought of um, weirdly ball things of the last Tyler, the creator album where it had those, um, oh, what's his name? DJ drama. DJ drama. It had this kind of DJ drama thing where he would like, he would frame the whole album with these like uh, DJ oh, drama radio, with these radio style, like um, cues and stuff. And I kind of wish the the album kind of, went in that direction a little bit more but that's more of an aside than anything it's um, probably a little more appropriate than me thinking of songs for the deaf <laughs> i thought of songs for the deaf too <laughs> yeah well that is a radio thing right and, and again it's almost mm -hmm. like um that album could have done that a little bit more but anyway uh i honestly this stretch got, gotten josh homie on here this stretch of the record from uh Dowley P through to uh, Alligator Tears. I honestly don't have a huge amount to say about. So Cole, Jake, Morgan, if you do, you guys have any thoughts on any of these other songs? Daughter, Spaghetti, Daughter. I, I, Daughter uh, is one of my favorite songs she's ever made. Yes, big ups to Daughter. I, Absolutely love it. I don't love any of these four really, but I also don't like feel negatively about them it's just a weird mm -hmm. part of the album where it's like almost halfway and it's mm. again, spaghetti it's... is extra frivolous so i can understand why there's some cuts on here that just kind of they, they come across as maybe uh less substantive than some of the uh, the more centerpiece tracks of the previous segments of the record you know mm -hmm. i like the rapping on spaghetti it's, it's yeah. nice yeah, to hear her. It's, it's awesome. nice to hear her do a little mm -hmm. bit of that rapidy rap rap that yeah. she can do. It, it, you could tell that they definitely started writing this album in 2019 because of the line at the sub of its fingers on Thanos. Oh yeah, the Thanos. <laughs> that did feel a little bit like what really? Okay, love it. Like, uh, oh, you just sign game, huh? And, and like, and look, and look, daughter Cute. is nice. You guys are gonna be have much more to say about it than me, but. Uh, I, I found it to be a little much with the whole like opera vocal thing and just how kind of, I don't know, it wasn't my flavor, but I will say just to forecast, there's not a, of all the main songs in this, there's not a single one I dislike. Yes. Including that mm. one, which we'll, which we're going to get to very soon. So um, yeah, there's just flavors of this that I'm a little bit less warm to it's kind of like this album goes in waves for me as it goes on where there's yeah. like st a stretch yeah. i really love then there's a stretch i'm not as into then there's another stretch that i like i'm really kick kicking it with and then like that there's no moment where that's like, just natural you know there's no moment where like one song comes on and just kind of kicks me out of it 
it's sort of like um the natural ebbs and flows the album has between like sections of it uh i'm i'm kind of it's that white album construction you know like it's it's just kind of one of those things that's designed to be kind of alienating out the gate that is just going to work with some people inherently more than others i guess the white album that see that's an interesting point of reference right because i i was thinking about this Beatles. when the album came out because this is this is X artist's white album is a critical line I have seen a lot of times, and it almost never makes sense to me because you almost know what, always. Do you know what the white album is? The white album is the product of four men who cannot stand being in the same room as each other, each other, just in a terrible mood all of the time. Uh, writing solo songs and then getting other members of the band to record their parts when they're not in the fucking studio. Or Eric and, Clapton. And then, like uh, being unable to kind of stand being in each other's company long enough to have a meeting about the track list or the, the shape of the album or anything, just throw that shit together. Uh, very seldom have I think we, we ever seen a, 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 a real analog to that. But people bringing up the White Album for Cowboy Card is interesting because it has a cover of a song from the White Album on it. Um, but I don't, and it kind of has a sort of sense of like, it pulls in different directions, but here it's like more of a purposeful artistic result of a singular vision. Whereas with the Beatles, the White Album pulled in different directions because John Paul, George and Ringo were pulling in different directions. Mm -hmm. But really, I think the the parallels, I don't know how f much further than that the parallels really go. Um, but it's just, I thought it was interesting uh, because not, it's the not first with time... intent, but with execution is what I meant. Yeah, I think it's just interesting because it's the first time like where I feel like that cliche has the added factor of a song from the White Album being on this thing in question, almost as though obviously the song is here for completely unrelated reasons, but it almost feels like Beyonce as an artist in making a 27 song album, you know, white album is 28 songs um, or, or 27. If you don't count revolution nine, which a lot of people don't um, as a song. I mean, um, I, I would like to see what Beyonce's revolution nine would even be because it would probably be really strange. Yeah. Well, um, so yeah, it's, it's like, on some surface level, it feels almost as though the record is kind of begging that comparison because of those really surface level um, similarities. Uh, but, you know, um, yeah. Anyway, that that's kind of just a, I wanted to sort of acknowledge that White Album thing because it's kind of a bit of a, of an, not an elephant in the room necessarily, but maybe an elephant in the neighborhood that um, that's kind of just, you're a bit worried. It's, it's going to, you're a bit worried that how close it is to your house. So um, ditch that. Um, but yeah, the, this run of Daughter of Spaghetti Alligator Tears, anything else you guys want to add on those songs? With this couple of run, this couple of tracks, you really see the more vengeful side to her really pop out. I mean, especially on Daughter, where she's talking about, oh yeah, the bathroom attendant let me in, and I beat the shit out of this girl and killed her. Just immediately followed by awesome. the aria, you know, Caro Mio Bien which absolutely beautiful, but I could understand if someone's maybe not into it as much because it's so extra and over the top. And, you know, I was like half expecting like an Ennio Morricone needle drop to happen at some point. I know, right? Yeah, you know what? <laughs> maybe I would have been on board. <laughs> that, that, would have, that would be so on point if she'd done, if she dropped a bit of Ennio on this album somewhere. I would have fucking, I would have loved that. Um, I might appreciate that song more now that you've kind of like, described it in that way already thinking back on alligator tears i have a little bit more of appreciation for this song because mm. of how again this is another moment on the record where the writing is just so sharp like a, yes. a song yeah. a so like if if my if i had a partner who wrote this song for me you know i i wouldn't know whether to i wouldn't know i might be fe fear for my life frankly because it's like <laughs> it has this it's this it's a kind of song you could only write about someone you've been with for a very long time where there is this kind of, uh, you know, our lives and our deaths are intertwined at this point. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there, you know, it really is as serious as life and death. And 
yeah. um, her Amy Dunn moment. Yeah, but it's like it, it, <laughs> it, it it's there's just that whole way and, and subtext of like a, a love that's that's that deathly real uh, in the song. Um, that, I, I, that sort of that vulnerability, that dynamic is what I think makes her writing on this album the best is that like when even when she's being big, bad bitch, Beyonce, is that there's sort of an understood element that, that, that like this part of her comes from a deeply insecure, very protective place that stems from her upbringing, that stems from where all of this conceptual conceit is rooted. So it's like, in essence, even though it's this big sprawling mess, it's also the most effective Beyonce origin story. Like this album to me is the most pivotal into understanding her as a writer and as an artist, like everything from her, like even back as far as like Destiny's Child and stuff, the songs of those overpowering, like like confidence and stuff, like the importance that this situates in her, in her narrative it starts to make more and more sense that this was going to be the first album in Renaissance because it does feel the most retrospective. It feels the most backward looking, but it also feels like it explains the most about her. And I find these facets mm -hmm. to be endlessly compelling. And it's on a track like this where it's like, I don't think that this is the strongest stem of like songs on the record, but it is one of the most multifaceted and one of the most revealing, I think. And it's that's what adds to the album's identity. It's an uncomfortable song because essentially it is a song that says, you lie to me and I still love you. How does it feel mm -hmm. to be loved by someone who knows that you lie, essentially? And that it, it's really cutting. It's really close to the bone. Uh, I, I love that aspect of it. Uh, yeah. it it's it's not a, an, an easy song to sit through if you're really like paying attention to what she's doing lyrically. And she repeats herself on mm -hmm. the song a lot. So she really emphasizes it. Um, and it, it is that kind of like, you know, sunrise in the morning, you're all I need and all I need is rain or the roots get weak. Sweet things need time to grow. Thinking about leaving hell. No, it's like, this is how much I love you. And, and you know, and I know that it's hard one and it's serious. Um, just for fun. I really love the song. The song has a lot of, I don't know much to yes. say about it. It just really kicks me back into the record. Um, yeah. It's a real shot of energy. Uh, Jake, mm -hmm. everything you said about Two Most Wanted, I concur. This is maybe my second or third favorite song on the album, depending on how I feel. First listen, it was my absolute favorite. Um, there's just the, the highest tier of this record is just so, has, has yeah. so many different kinds of songs in it that it's kind of hard to pick one. Uh, please, it's, Miley, it's, oh I'm God, begging I'm you that... to work with Ryan Tedder again. Please, please yeah. Yeah. do it. But I think this is and definitely. Oh my the... God, that landslide interpolation. Yes. Thank you. I was about to bring that up. Yes. Beautifully done. I think this is um, <laughs> the best duet on the record. Probably, maybe, maybe my favorite duet she's ever done. She doesn't really do a huge amount of duets, I guess. But, no, um, she's not big on them. Because but... that, you know, it doesn't really jibe with the kind of performer that she is but it's a beautiful yeah. duet and it's beautiful because it's 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 a real duet it's not just featuring my like they're going back and forth and they both deliver really powerful vocal performances um miley's not turning it down just because she's on a beyonce song um and that works you know it, it's really Get the out of my house with this shit it's really good it's really powerful it's really effective um i really dig it you know levi's jeans yeah, look, I I hate Post Malone as much as the next person who hates Post Malone. Uh, but you even hate his good songs. But the, the but we must remember that no Post such Malone thing is, exists. Post Malone is not the only thing that is in this song. You know what else is in the song? Fucking Nile Rogers playing that Thank guitar. Thank you. It's God sick. Oh yeah. I, as soon we as I to heard mention. it, as soon as I heard it, I was like, wait. That's a, who's playing this guitar it's it sounds mm -hmm. like like 70s i look it up and it's fucking nile rogers right <sighs> nile rogers on this stevie wonders playing the harmonica on jolene i didn't even jesus know christ. that like really? jesus christ yeah uh-huh like the, the the collaborators that she can call in at the drop of a hat is yeah. insane uh and especially on texas hold'em uh rhiannon giddens uh, a black female artist. She plays the fiddle on it, mm -hmm. which is a really prominent thing because Rhiannon Giddens' entire 
thing that she does is teaching people about the importance of the fiddle in black music mm. and getting people involved into playing it more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the most I just, I just sorry, you come I just want to say you can get you can call Stevie Wonder to play harmonica for you, and you get post fucking Malone to do it with you on this song. I I, I like it's infuriating. I, I, I think it, uh, I would there was no that problem. one tweet that was like, imagine T Pain as the male vocal on this song. <laughs> My problem I, with Post Malone's feature is not that he's on it, it's that he has like a, a bit where he does his thing. Like if he was just trading off on the chorus with her, fine. But I don't need there to be a, any kind of moment on any Beyonce song where Post Malone alludes to eating ass. I don't need that shit in my life. I don't need fair. It. That's fair. I don't I, need. I don't need to imagine it. I don't need to conceptualize it. I certainly don't need to hear it. Like if what does he say? If we it's could so replace, fucking... if we could replace one feature on this album, I would definitely replace Post Malone. Like, mm-hmm. f- f- think about this for a moment here. What if we got somebody on this album like Yola? I know it's a little left of the dial for Beyonce, but like, imagine that kind of duet, man. That would kill. It Look, would I don't, kill. I get it. Like, he's got the right kind of voice for this. You know, he's got that kind of that kind of accent, yes. and and I I think he, you know, he's fine. I like the song. The song's good. I I, I it's grown yes. on me. Um, <laughs> Morgan's oh, yeah, yeah. just like no, <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> it, it's it's not my favorite back on the album but i can tell that this was you know made for radio of like yeah it's also just like i uh, it's also just like i don't necessarily need like a like a a fuck song on this kind of record like especially a song that's just like basically we got a bunch of those on the last album you know but again like he says like i'm going nosedive on that thing or something and i'm just like i (laughs) it's like no it's like watching it it feels like watching your parents make a sex joke or something it's, it's just bad it's, um, I, I wish i could have seen jay-z's face during the recording session on this lo- i'll 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 briefly bring up um what todd in the shadows said about uh beyonce doing a duet with ed sheeran is that from if you look at that from a macro standpoint ed sheeran is a small baby and beyonce is a deity that's been worshipped for centuries this doesn't work <laughs> Yeah. Let's move swiftly along because we've got a little bit to cover in a short amount of time. We need to talk about mm-hmm. one of the big album centerpieces, which is Yeah Yeah. Uh, you know, following mm. that, following that wonderful Linda Martel intro as well. This absolute colossus, uh, one of the most energetic songs on the record, one of the songs I think with the most direct sort of cultural significance as well, because it's directly about the Chitlin circuit, um, mm-hmm. all of the black artists who played music who who commanded clubs in the face of you know an aggressively an aggressive resistance from white audiences and from well not necessarily from white audiences because a lot of white audiences were really into it but like a lot from just uh from the white establishment the white establishment thank you that was the word i was looking for um to you know starting with the nancy sinatra interpolation going through Mm. the the just the heavy you know, sort of gospel and soul influence of the song, the stomp that it has. It's just an absolutely arresting moment. Like it makes total sense on an album like this. And yet also the first time I got to it, I was like blindsided by it. It's just absolutely raucous. Mm -hmm. So much fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's an absolute blast. It's the most Tina Turner-esque song she's ever recorded. And considering the huge amount of influence Tina Turner had on her, I mean, Tina Turner, Turner was Beyonce's Beyonce and that really shines through on here so you yeah. hear the song and you think it's amazing and then you get to the good vibrations lyrics being woven Ooh. in and you're like is this the most expensive album ever made yeah when you when you said like this was <laughs> you this know? was supposed to come out several years ago I, I was in my head I was wondering if one of the reasons was like clearance <laughs> of like yeah. so much shit on this record <laughs> and this has to this has to have like this has to be the most expensive album she's ever made just because of all of that oh god all of the big names yeah. that she's either pulled in to work with her or you know who she's sampling um yeah massive fucking tune 
Uh, then we go into kind of the final arc of the album, starting with River Dance, which I'm not mm-hmm. super into River Dance. I find the the bounce on the shit dance thing it kind of gets grating after a while. Um, but I like it because it sets up another one of my absolute favorite songs in the record, which is Two Hands to Heaven. Hands. The way that yes. that comes in from River Dance is really, really satisfying as a transition. Um, but also the song is just kind of beautiful. It's sort of a song about, you know, escaping and, and reveling in, in yourself and in a, a moment of just kind of like pure inhibition, you know, drinking a bottle of whiskey, dancing, being free. Like like two hands to heaven, quite literally, just being on the floor. There's a lot of spiritually. Music. It's the most like Renaissance of anything on here. Lyrically, yeah, there's, there's yeah, it's, a lot of it's the Burgos groove of the album. Yeah, there's yes. a lot of music on this record, obviously, that makes you feel like dancing and throwing your hands up and having a good time. But it's like this is one of the songs. This is the song that to me is like most about the pure ecstasy of that experience. <laughs> Um, and yes, yeah, mm. spiritually, it shares that connection with Renaissance, but it's in its own lane. Like it fits within the, this yeah. world in terms of how it sounds. It's beautiful as well. Like it's one of the most lush songs on the album. It, it's yeah. dreamy and atmospheric. It feels like it's beamed in, you know, from from like a different plane almost, while fitting mm-hmm. completely with with the sounds that Beyonce has established on this record. Mm-hmm. I I, I yeah, kind of that wish underworld was... sample is killer. Yep. Yeah, right. thank you. And uh, I kind of—it's the kind of song that I wish was kind of like twice as long. I could listen to it for like I could listen to the the twelve inch mix, you know, the twelve inch remix, mm-hmm. which is like eighteen minutes long or whatever, whatever New Order and Underworld used to do. Um, mm-hmm. And then it goes into Tyrant, which I kind of forecasted earlier as a favorite of mine. Uh, Stellar song. The okay, so we talked about fiddle before, bro. That fiddle sample here is going the fuck off, but also oh. Tyrant. If it's all right, it's just I fucking love. It's an amazing whole, hook. The vibe, the energy, it's just like I, I can't critically intellectualize this at all. It's just really fucking fucking sick beats. I I mm-hmm. I, I cannot agree with you more. It's kind of why, like, I know in my critical brain, I should probably take more issue with the fact that the album doesn't go from two hands to heaven into amen to kind of end it all but i'm sorry the back-to-back of tired and sweet honey bucket is so much fucking fun i i can't help it i i like i if i theoretically did that change in my head i think i'd like the album less well it's nice because I mean, um... just ending the album on like with with two of the most fun songs before that epilogue mm-hmm. track i think is like really reinforces what the whole thing is all about yes you know? absolutely because right. you're sitting there you know you're like scratching your fingernails along at the beginning of tyrant with that really <laughs> incredible introduction and then you hear the fiddle and the beat drop and then you're just having a blast with that song and then you get the sweet honey bucking where she starts by singing Patsy Cline over mm-hmm. a Jersey club beat. And then so you get sick. into honey, which is like sweet, you know, la da da. And then you get to bucking where she's just like bucking, going oh. ape shit. That's <laughs> awesome. Bucking. Look at that horse. Bucking. Look at that horse. Oh, that horse. thank you. I love the look at that horse. Bucking. Look at that horse. <laughs> Like, yes, that's the only way... I've been saying that every time I see a horse when I drive past. <laughs> that's the only way I ever want to hear anyone pronounce the word horse from now on. It's just do that, do that like like deep throat ah uh, sound. Um, yeah, like it's kind of it's it's kind of really cool to have this sort of like frankenstein's monster three-parter like at the end of the album is like a kind of microcosm in a song of, or like a reinforcement of all the kind of like you know blending and mashing together of sounds that the whole album's done yeah. um, i can't wait for act three where she's got like a four-part song at the very end <laughs> god go for it um I, I, and amen is beautiful as well like Amen's yes, gorgeous. gorgeous the mm-hmm. way that it like circles back towards american requiem as the song goes on uh is like you know it, it's 
not the most inventive piece of circ of, of of circular bringing back to home ever, but it's like it's perfect for what it does. Um, mm -hmm. And it, again, it's like it, it's like American Requiem. It's a song that kind of reinforces you know the the, the material gravity of you know, the, the the substance of what the album is about. You know, this house was built with blood mm. and bone and it crumbled. You know, that 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 the present we can exist in where all of these genres and again genre is a construction, you know, that once upon a time functioned in a large part to decide which groups of people could play which groups of music, right? So to bring this whole thing full circle and it's talking about, you know, to get to this point where, you know, black people, black women in particular can do the kind of things with genre that Beyonce's done here. It was a hard fought battle. It took a long time, a lot longer than it should have, obviously. And, you know, Beyonce does a, a great job of reinforcing, you know, the gravity of that and the significance of that again without making it all too much about her as being the person who did it um because i think if beyonce was too self-congratulatory with this album it would detract from the power of what she's trying to do so what what most i definitely. what i respect about her is that she's able to for the most part pull back from self-congratulation and pull back from self-aggrandizement because the material would would not suit that and again that's where i think some parts of the album where it, it, she's feeling herself a little bit more not all of them but some parts of them don't quite land in the best way they could because of context um because to me it's the there's so much humbling there's the real there's so much humble humbleness is not a word there's so much i don't think humility Humility, thank you. That's exactly the word my brain was looking for. There's so much humility in this album and so much solidarity and so much kind of reinforcing the point that it's a journey that a lot of people have had to make. It's a fight that a lot of people have had to fight. Um, and yeah, here's my experience with it. Here's my you know vision of it. But it is also mm -hmm. at the end of the day about more than just me. And I and I appreciate Beyonce's, you know, being able to show that humility given how much she's known for her self-aggrandizement, which again, it's not a bad thing. It's a thing she's earned and it's a thing that makes her charismatic. But the way that that's played down here compared to her other records is meaningful. Uh, and part of what I think makes the record, you know, stand out for her among many other things. Mm. So closing thoughts, Cole. Uh, I was really nervous about this record before it dropped because, you know, again, not big into country music on the whole, although there's definitely a lot more artists that I'm open to listening to now. Um, some people I'm going to explore a little bit more, um, you, you know, really as part of the goal of this entire project. Mm. Um, I will say Renaissance holds a personal place in my heart just because that is the gayest music she's ever going to make in her entire life. Yeah. But 100%. the amount of people who will call this like her magnum opus so far of everything she's done, um, I completely see where they're coming from. And I do agree with them. It's just such a big, massive, sprawling, ambitious album that, you know, even if there's like odd moments that stick out, you know, some things that might not work quite entirely. It's still just such a massive, gigantic, you know, swing for the fences that basically no artist of her caliber is doing anymore and to see the success that it's having it's actually uh opened higher than renaissance did it's gotten a lot more streams quickly than renaissance did so the fact that people generally seem to be responding to it pretty well is very exciting hmm. and you know i can't wait to see how this project so continues i she alludes to it on one song, but um, do we think this will be the one that finally nets her the AOTY, the Grammy? It feels like this could... It feels like if any album was positioned to take 
a well, spotlight. Well, it's an album again, where she specifically not... calls out the fact that she's not been yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but but like I mean, that's again, we're assuming that the people who are would be voting for her in this instance even pick up on that, which is debatable. But I mean, like <laughs> just like I mean, look at the album cover. It's like that's that alone feels like a statement that it feels like that that this is not that the Grammys matter, but like this is. Like, uh, if this doesn't get her that, I can't imagine anything else would other than being like, oh, well, you know, now she's a legacy artist and we, we, we're we not going to give it to anyone better. So let's give it to her. Just so look, like, at hey. look at that look horse. Look at that horse. Look at that horse. I, I, I will say I, I think that for all of its messiness, and it undeniably is, I feel like every thread within Cowboy Carter can go back to the overarching theme of just the idea of the reclamation of power. And when you, when I view it through that lens, it's a bit more of a tight affair than it might be initially like perceived as, I guess. But it is the thing of hers that has excited me the most and is feels like it revels in the potential of somebody like Beyonce, just because while I do love me a good tight well-produced you know conceptual record where you know all the i's are dotted and all the t's are crossed this is also something that like i can't get anything this big this fun this exciting from anybody else right now and it feels like just like we have a a, a clear open space for beyonce to, to dominate in this one particular lane and she absolutely did and she did it with a, a sound that i feel like is is more confident than it has any right being uh and with songwriting that's fantastic it's just it hits all the marks that it should and for all mm -hmm. the ways that it's you know weird different is that it just has more character that way and i prefer it it's it's a it's definitely not going to be for everybody, but dear God, am I glad in a pop starved landscape that we have it right now because it's been on permanent rotation for me ever since it dropped. And I really doubt that that's going to change anytime soon because I, I, I just never want to not be listening to Bodyguard on a loop, <laughs> frankly. Sorry. Before we before oh. we lose you, Cole, I just want to ask: uh, what, Do we have any predictions for Act Three? Like, what will the yeah. gam what will the gambit be? Any you any know, thoughts or any ideas? There's been no color horse. Will she be on? Uh, <laughs> I hope it's a black horse on fire. Um, a lot of people, for whatever reason, just took to the Vogue thread she did for Vogue UK back in 2022 when Renaissance came out because there was a photo of her on a horse. There was a photo of her on a giant disco ball. Mm. And then the next photo was her on a motorcycle all decked out in leather and, you know, like metal spikes. So all I'm going to say is if Let's the hot. third Let's... act is uh, rock and like metal and rock and roll. A Dude, lot if of Beyonce makes be a hair scared. metal album, I'm going to lose my fucking would, mind. I, the, 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 all the leather brought to mind Motorhead for me, which yeah. would be Dude. sicker. That's so I, that's so dangerous for us because if she doesn't do a good job of it, it'll tear this podcast apart. Like if she's like <laughs> if she's like I'm going true. I'm going metal and she just gets like fucking Jack White and and who else don't we like that she likes sleep token. <laughs> No, oh, I mean like you know, like um, <laughs> retro guys, like Dan Auerbach or something, and and Jack White, and like gets all those guys, and and, and... get get Tobias Force. I love the idea that she seems to be going for with this trilogy of like different sort of traditions of of music or just different traditions of culture or however you want to like define it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's really a really cool conceit for a trilogy as opposed to just here are three albums i made in the same sort of headspace to actually have like a distinctive identity for each is really cool um so yeah we'll see what happens i i really admire so much of what this album does and it just it's, it's i've remarked before how i say this about at least one album every episode it feels like but Good lord, it's too long. If it was like three quarters the length it was, I would be like, tighten up the screws a little bit. On the other hand, at this stage in her career, it feels a little bit like 
going up to I don't know Scorsese or somebody and just being like, "Hey, tighten up the yeah. edit, bud. Make a shorter, make a shorter movie." There is some degree of which this music is not really for me as a uh, uh, pace as you know Kentucky's pastiest white boy. So it's just like you know. I enjoy a lot of it for what it is, and I'm thankful for that. But mm. she ain't mm. Renaissance to me. That, that's <laughs> probably came across a lot colder, cold. colder than you meant it to be. Uh, we'll we'll see if if uh, it's just the Renaissance is great, and this is less great. That is really <laughs> it was a bar, is what it was. Yeah, Cole, thank you for joining us once again. Always a pleasure to have you. We were absolutely we're. we're utterly ill-equipped to discuss Beyonce without you. So I'm glad we could pull this <laughs> off. Thank you for watching, folks. Let us know what you think of either of the albums we've discussed today, Vampire Weekend's Only God Was Above Us and Beyonce's Cowboy Carter in the comments below. Until next time, though, folks, rock over mm. London, rock on Chicago, Texas, the Lone Star State.